The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Insight, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in this video, we're going back for more computer data storage. So you may remember back in episode 17, we did a data storage compilation. Uh, and we followed that up with uh, magnetic tape storage, uh, an auto changer. But uh, on the episode 17 comments over on the Element 14 community, it was raised as a really good point to me from Dab, uh, who noted that he used to work with punched paper and punched cards. And uh, yeah, it's something I've never worked with, so it never even occurred to me. But as a result, here we are. And I have with me here a Remex RRS 1150BC1625GB U901. Catchy, no? So let's for a second talk about the media. And if you're not familiar, I don't think anyone's going to blame you. This is a legacy one. So imagine it's about 1750s and uh, you've got a loom, a weaving machine, which you want to repeatedly make a pattern. So how do you automate that? Well, you have some sort of media with holes punched in it, which can be read by pins that compress or don't as they go through the holes. And that leads you to punched cards. So that media existed for about a hundred years before electricity really became mainstream. And then you had uh, teletype machines or the pre parents of, and they started using tape to present continuous data. Now this is an example of 7-bit tape, might be 8-bit tape even. Now you can see on the leader that you've got these small perforations, they're smaller than the rest of the holes for the data. And that is represented, that's uh, the feed, that's actually gripped by a, a sprocket on the front of the machine that pulls the tape through at a fixed speed. The spools either side just take up the slack or feed off the slack to provide enough that the uh, sprocket can pull this through. And then you start to get these control bits at the beginning. Now, one, two, three, because there's actually one missing over here. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is eight bit tape and eight holes give you a full bit. And you can start to see as the data goes through, each horizontal line across the tape or vertical line, depending on which way you're looking at it, each line of bits perpendicular across the tape are your data. And you can see this goes through. Now, what I've got here is actually a copy of 4K basic on tape, and that is awesome. Okay, the machine I've got hold of is, well, it's clearly seen a hard life. It's uh, heavy. Again, it's got a transformer in it that makes it weigh a ton, but here it is. And it's got absolute minimum of manual controls. And I understand this can be controlled through its electronic interface on the back as well. I don't have any spools that I can put the tape on here properly with. But just for the sake of completeness, I will do my best to show you the correct spooling technique. So this would be on here. This is the loading position. And it would go up there, around there. And there's the sprocket that will actually read the tape, that pulls the tape through at the given speed. And onto the pickup spool. That's pretty much it. And there is a lamp right here. You see the back of the terminals on it which shines a light through and we'll see what kind of sensors they've got in here afterwards. But you can see direction, power and some other load and spool and loop controls. So the other thing to note is this is a 19 inch rack mount and that comes from its uh, very industrial background and history. Uh, I'm pretty sure, although I really struggle to find good information on this machine anywhere, Certainly didn't get as far as finding a manual, although everything I read seems to indicate this was used with CNC machines. And much later than you would think too, sort of uh, 70s, even the early 80s, paper tape being used for CNC machines, which I think is a bit weird. In terms of the rear of the device, so you've got transformer with multi-tapping so that you can modify to make variable voltage. We can go from 100 right up to 127 volts. And I think this is 50 and 60 hertz tolerant. This is the control and data bus. I'm pretty sure the 
8-bit output from the paper tape comes straight out of here and there are some other pins reserved for uh, control so the tape playback or control of the tape feed can be done remotely by whatever's receiving the data. Uh, you've got a fuse and a power input. Now here we've got uh, some cards. Now let's start with those. They seem nice and easy. So I've got three cards in here and fortunately they pop out and are swappable. So the three cards, let's get them all out, put them side by side, try and work out first of all what they do. So let's start with the obvious one. This one's got to be rectification and power. So the transformer is still going to give you a lower voltage, but still AC out. And that needs to be rectified to DC for a lot of this equipment to be usable. So that's going to be the power card. And look at the size of these parts. They're enormous. And then you flip it over and look at the traces on here as well. Now you can see these PCB edge connectors that all three use are very common. And I think we will try and trace out a little bit of the wiring later. You can see how big these planes are and they use multiple pins to actually get the current rating high enough to be uh, used on that edge connector. I do have assembly part numbers up here which may help us identify if we can't exactly nail it out what these might do. Now the second card we have, based on the size of the MOSFETs down here, I'm going to go ahead and assume this is motor control because you've got the constant speed feedback from, well, I'll assume it's given feedback and you need to vary the voltage or even the pulse width modulation to the spool motor because that read has got to be absolutely spot on to a baseline speed. And yeah, that makes sense. Speed control and you've probably got some input and output to the two spool motors as well controlled from here. Now we've got four MOSFETs by the looks of things. Does that mean they're paired up for the two spool motors, or does that mean there's something else which I'm missing that needs a MOSFET control? And they're all individual. We will dig into that later. And this last card has actually got a number of ICs on it, and three smaller MOSFETs and transistors. So we'll look into this further. We'll try and get some part numbers off of these ICs and see exactly what it does. I think this is going to be a lot of signal and control, so this will be taking the inputs from the external bus and reading data back and amplifying it to the right signal uh, signal quality. Well, that's kind of the data bus. And it's interesting that this has actually got slots for more things. And I don't know if everyone's going to agree with this, but I think this would qualify as a very simple or open source or, I don't know, does this count as a backplane? Does it cover off the transformer? Actually, 1.5 amps at 240 volts is still going to be uh, 360 watts. So it's not it's not small energy consumption, I suppose. You remember I said this was sort of multi-voltage? Well, you can see that the uh, incoming mains are on 0 volts and 115 volts. So if you wanted to set this up to be used in my country, I would have to desolder that wire and resolder it onto the 240 volt tapping on the transformer. Should also note, I actually have no idea how old this is. I'm hoping somewhere inside we're going to find a date of assembly or manufacture. Because like I said, I really struggled to nail down any information on this machine. Things like this were in use with CNC machines right up through the 80s. So it's hard to know whether it was actually kind of modern or kind of old. Ah, excellent. All of the front is on connectors. Yes. It's also very interesting to me that there's an unpopulated card which could have been in here. So what would that extra card have done? I wonder if we can sort of derive from how the harness is wired up, what extra function that would have fulfilled. Um, that should hopefully be loose, but I think I'm going to send the whole lot kind of that way through the case. Oh, no, the fuse is still connected. So... The that's confused me. So that was neutral, ground. This was live, obviously multi-voltage tapping on the output, input even. What on earth is mains voltage doing in here? Now I can tell you there is a lot of weight in that transformer. And that is a, that feels like a paper and wax 
wound transformer, which is just crazy. Maybe this is older than I thought it was. So there you go, there are backplane connectors, or not, depending on whether we think it warrants the name or not. But uh, you know, I hadn't noticed this earlier, there's actually notches in here which will key up with um, the cards, so you can't put the wrong card in the wrong slot. So here is the part itself, the good bit business end. So should we take a spool motor off first? That lever is sort of mounted down here with a linkage which comes up here to this potentiometer. I mean, it's really hard to show that out of position now. Oh, I've got one here. So this potentiometer is providing the feedback to control the speed of this motor. The belt's really a bit of a mystery because, I don't know, maybe that was rubber and it's just, just got the reinforcement showing, but it's not a material. The motor's still good. But yeah, this is really funny material. It's like it's a woven strand of something very, very hard. There's no stretch in it at all. Odd. So on the back, Yakasawa Electric. Oh, these are DC motors. 12 volt DC motors, giant flat DC motors. So there's a potentiometer that attached to that linkage and that controlled the speed of the motor. And that motor is actually driven. Oh, so there's feedback as well. So I'm assuming this is a motor and this is providing feedback. So that's like a dynamo or a generator. It's giving speed feedback. So why would it need to know that? If it's feeding through this motor at a constant speed using the, the sprockets engaged in the paper holes, other than the fact it needs to know the tension, why would it care? Oh, I know why it would care. If it gets to the end of the program and rolls the paper all the way off, the papers all of a sudden disappeared through the mechanism. And rather than just keep this spinning at really, well, I say high speed, relatively high speed, you can detect that it's no longer spinning and turn it off. No, because this is going to spin. No, it wouldn't. It would stop spinning. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so confused. Yeah, there you go. The faster it spins, the higher the voltage it generates. So that's analog feedback on the speed of the motor. So we've got a forward and back direction. And we've got loop, spool, load, three position switches. Aha! Got the lamp. So we've got a tiny little daughter board that feeds the lamp. Or at least the lamp holder. And what is the deal here? Right, incandescent lamps don't actually follow Ohm's law. They uh they have very low resistance when they're off, but they ramp up to high resistance very quickly as the filament gets hot. Now, I think that's probably a resistor. Um, and they put that across the lamp to make sure you don't get a high inrush current to that lamp, which will basically extend the lamp's life. Um, so most incandescent bulbs blow when you first energize them. Um, by putting a resistor in in series with it, you're you're gonna make its life longer. Yeah, you'll reduce its operating voltage, but again, less energy. It should save its life. Oh, and it's actually soldered on. I, I assume that would be a lamp holder, uh, but no. Sure enough, that is the lamp with a little lens on the front. So it's a very specialist lamp uh, to have that lens on there, and it just shines into here. Okay, so that little that little bit that held the lamp sort of on here is just an optical distribution box and you can see we've now got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine little outputs. So they're actually using one of these to read the speed of the perforations. So they're presumably getting active feedback on the speed, feed rate from this sprocket. Um, and if I get a light, excuse my phone, Let's face it, who doesn't have one? Hopefully you can see really clearly those nine little light parts. So this is the main read mechanism for the tape. 
and I've got no idea what to expect. So this is the little plate that keeps the tape pressed against the sensor. I would imagine that has to be taken off for cleaning because these, like we had with the, uh, the light distributor on top, I can see on the top surface of this plastic here a number of holes. So I'm assuming these are the read light inputs to whatever the sensor is underneath. And they would have to be kept absolutely spotlessly clean to, uh, to get a good signal. And frankly, I don't think this is very good. And what do we think they're going to be? Are they going to be LDRs, light dependent resistors? Or are light dependent resistors too fast, too slow, sorry, for the feed rate of uh, the changing intensity that you'd expect for this? Oh, no! A sealed unit. Sensortech, pattern 3571600. At least we've got a pattern number we can look up. And the trouble is I don't even think I'd get much mileage in taking that apart. I would suspect that's completely potted. There you go, and there's the sprocket and the feed motor, and also giant heatsink. I mean, I don't know how hot this gets, but that's fairly significant. I think 4973, week 49 of 1973, actually puts this in about the right ballpark. Okay, so we've had a little bit of a look at all of the various parts. Now, if we jump back to the wiring harness, see if we can work out a little bit more what's going on. So, another seven pin connector in the center was this one. Yeah, sprocket motor was driven from here. So the MOSFETs on this card are paired up and drive the spool motors, whereas these MOSFETs drive the spool the sprocket motor. Now I think it's fairly safe to assume that the input from the data signal, which is this monstrous, what was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pin. 12 pins here, it actually goes partly straight out. In fact, how many pins go straight out? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the data comes straight off of the reed head out to the auxiliary port on the back. And the other ones, these four pins here, some of them go to this additional card that we didn't have in ours and some of them go to the uh, this card. So some of those are going to be your VCCs, your voltage, your ground. There's an extra two pins. What did they do? As far as I can tell, this has been a really interesting teardown. Just to see how that grandfather of physical data storage worked. And some of the techniques to make this modular, which is sort of like the grandparent of modern expansion cards and things that we see a lot today in what is now known as PCs. Uh, if you've got an idea for a teardown that you'd like to see, don't forget to head over to the Element 14 community. You can find me, A531016, at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.